Hey, what's up YouTube? Welcome back to another episode of Intuition. In today's video, we're going to be tackling some infectious disease questions. Stay tuned. Alright, so in today's video, we're going to be answering three questions about infectious disease. These questions are going to be more concept driven questions that will that will allow you to develop a deeper understanding of how to treat infectious diseases. These conceptual types of questions will go a long way in helping you pick the right answers and to guess the right answers on the exam since you can't memorize everything. So with that said, let's dive into these three questions. All right, question number one. So question number one states, systemic inflammatory response syndrome is characterized by all of the following except, okay, so it sounds like a pretty straightforward question, right? We're basically being asked to identify all the characteristics that are associated with systemic inflammatory response syndrome and pick out the one characteristic that is not associated with SIRS. Now, before we dive into the answer choices, let's make sure that we understand what SIRS is. Systemic inflammatory response syndrome, that's a response syndrome, right? And it's usually a response to distress something going on in the body. Typically it's an infection, but it doesn't necessarily have to be an infection, but it's a uh, is going to be a widespread immune response that the body is going to mount to help get the body ready to fight off an infection or some other type of illness. You can almost think of SIRS as pre-sepsis. Sepsis is a little bit more severe in terms of you're starting to have you're starting to have organ failure on the body is shutting down and blood pressure starts to drop and so forth. When that occurs, those are definite signs of sepsis or shock. But SIRS is a syndrome that occurs before the body goes into septic shock. So the characteristics of SIRS are going to be warnings that something severe could occur if, if this infection or this illness is not brought under control. Okay, so let's go ahead and see what characteristics we would associate with someone who's developing an infection. Answer choice A says, respiratory rate above 20 breaths per minute. If someone's body is going into distress, you would definitely think that increased respiratory rate would be a sign because typically when your body is mounting such a response, it's going to require a lot of oxygen to be able to mount such a response. And so you're going to breathe a lot faster because the body is trying to get in as much oxygen as it can to be able to, to, be able to create the energy that it would take to mount a response. You'll need that extra energy from oxygen to be able to increase the body temperature and increase the body's immune system to fight off the infection. So increasing respiratory rate would definitely be a sign of SIRS. B says temperature below 96 degrees Fahrenheit. This one is a little bit tricky because you might think, well, someone is get developing an infection. Usually they develop a fever. So the body's temperature increases so that they can help fight off the infection. But the body doesn't always react that way. So the body can either have a temperature spike or it can have a significant temperature drop. A significant change in temperature, whether it's significantly increased or significantly decreased, would be an association with SIRS because it's a sign of distress. Optimal temperature is 98.6, so if you're above 101 or if you're below 96, that's a problem. C says heart rate above 90 beats per minute. This is tied with A. You're increasing your breathing rate to get more oxygen. Another way to get more oxygen to the body is for the heart to beat at a faster rate. Increasing heart rate is definitely a sign of distress because it tells you that your body really needs a lot of oxygen to be able to get something done. So that leaves us with D, which has to be the exception. D says systolic blood pressure below 100 millimeters of mercury. A low blood pressure is definitely linked to distress, right? But remember, SIRS are more of the preliminary distress syndrome that's, that occurs before the body actually shuts down. Once the blood pressure starts dropping below 100 and even lower than that, that is a sign of severe sepsis. SIRS is the beginning of sepsis, but once the blood pressure starts dropping, once the organs start failing, then you're no longer in mild sepsis. That's severe sepsis. So this would be the exception. So D would be the exception to SIRS. All right, so I hope that makes sense. With that said, let's go on to question number two. Okay, question number two. Question number two states, optimal dosing of aminoglycosides is characterized by very high peaks and very low troughs, whereas vancomycin requires high drug exposure, AUC. What does this imply about aminoglycosides and vancomycin? So we're being told that, that aminoglycosides, aminoglycosides, these are your 
uh, antibiotics against gram negatives such as pseudomonas, right? So aminoglycosides would be like tobramycin, gentamicin, amikacin. So these drugs work best when they have a high peak concentration and when they have a very low trough concentration. Whereas vancomycin works best when, when the patient has a lot of exposure to the drug, when the AUC is large. So vancomycin, you want good exposure. Aminoglycoside, you want high concentration. And in this question, we're being asked to choose the answer that best explains why these drugs work best under these characteristics. So let's go ahead and look at the answer choices. Answer choice A says, vancomycin is concentration dependent and aminoglycoside is time dependent. Now, aminoglycoside works best when the concentration is high, right? That, that's what it means by having a high peak. So if they work best when they have a high peak, it must mean that aminoglycosides are concentration dependent, not time dependent. So right off the bat, this answer choice is incorrect. B says vancomycin is time dependent and aminoglycosides are concentration dependent. Okay, this one makes sense, right? Because aminoglycosides work best when they have a very high peaks. The high peak means that it works best when it has high concentration. And vancomycin works best when it has a high AUC. What is AUC? Well, AUC is a combination of the average drug concentration and the amount of time that the drug spends within the body. So AUC is a function of both concentration and time. Well, so why is vancomycin considered time dependent? It seems like vancomycin should be considered both time and concentration dependent, but it's listed under time dependent because, because that's just the convention. But in reality, vancomycin depends on concentration and time. And I guess that vancomycin is given the characteristic of being time dependent because every drug to some extent depends on concentration. But for vancomycin, there is a strong time component that impacts how well it treats the infection. So vancomycin will be classified as time dependent. So B will be the correct answer. Okay, all right, so let's go on to question number three. Question number three says, when caring for a patient with a suspected infection, how should the following modes of treatment be prioritized in terms of what should be done first, second, third, and fourth. We're given four different modes of treatment and we're supposed to rank those in terms of what should be done first, second, third, and fourth. So what should be done first? Well, let's think about it. When it comes to treating the patient, the, the first question that you wanna ask is, how sick is the patient? If the patient is in shock, then the first thing you wanna do is you wanna stabilize the patient. If the blood pressure is falling at a drastic rate, the first thing you wanna do is you wanna get that blood pressure under control. So you probably want to give like epinephrine and you definitely want to give fluids to help increase that blood pressure. So that allows us to eliminate answer choice A. We're left with B, C, and D. Now, what should we do next? The second question you want to ask is, what is causing that infection? Because you can treat the patient all you want. If the source of infection is not dealt with, then the patient is going to continue to have recurrence of infections. So is the infection being caused by a port? Is it being caused by an open wound that needs surgery? Is it being caused by an abscess that needs to be drained? So knowing the source of infection is paramount to treating infectious diseases. So after stabilizing the patient, the next thing that you want to know is the source of infection and how you can and how you can eliminate that source of infection. So automatically we know that the answer should be answer choice B, right? B says stabilize the patient control the source of infection, then prescribe empiric antibiotic, okay? B makes perfect sense because knowing the source of infection also gives you insight as to what bacteria could be causing the infection. And having insight into what bacteria could be causing the infection would allow you to choose the proper empiric antibiotics to help combat that infection. And of course, once you have, once you have prescribed empiric antibiotics, then you wanna get blood cultures to verify that the empiric antibiotics are actually the right antibiotic. Once you get your cultures back, then you will be able to know whether or not you chose the proper empiric antibiotics or whether you need to discontinue the empiric antibiotics and choose the proper antibiotics that actually covers the bacteria that's shown on the blood on the cultures. So that would be the system that you would use to treat infectious disease. All right. So I hope that that makes sense for you guys. If you have any questions, go ahead and leave it in the comment section below. As always, we release video every week on this channel, sometimes twice a week. So keep watching, keep learning. And as always, I'll see you guys next week. All right, bye-bye.